Good morning. I just have to get something off my chest. I love the people in this church. I love them. I'm going to ask you to stand. God is in the house this morning. All right, y'all. We need a little help. Here we go. All right. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Yes, I do. To the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony. This is my testimony. Yes. Come together, sons and daughters. Walk with blood and wash with water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father, our God. We'll finish what he started. Our God will finish what he started. This is my testimony from death to life. Because grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Do you believe it? Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, then you're not done. is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony oh I'm alive this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony.
but he is so much more.
are awesome. Wasn't that fun? <laughs> Please feel free to have a seat. My name is Celeste, and uh, I have the privilege of praying for our service this morning, and I'd love it if you would join me in prayer. So, God, we just thank you so much for this day that we are here, that you are here. God, thank you even for special gifts like sunshine and snow melting. You are amazing. And God, please help all of us in this room that we would draw closer to you today. Um, God, would you please help all of us just to know a little bit more how much you love us and care for us, how much you are able to empower us, how much you are able to work in our lives, the lives of the people around us. God, please help us all to leave here today trusting you more. And we thank you so much for all of the volunteers and kids who are in kids ministry right now. Lord, please help all of the kids that they too would hear that message that you love them, that you love them so much. Please drive that message deep into their hearts. And thank you so much for our volunteers. Please help them too to know that they are loved, that what they're doing is significant. Please give them lots of patience and joy in their work. Help them to have a lot of fun there with the kids. Thank you, God, that you care for us. And we ask all these things in the name of our Savior and our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome everyone, all of you here in the room. I'm so glad you're here. Everyone who's able to join us online, thank you for doing that. And if you're a guest here, an extra special welcome to you because you're taking a chance on us. And we sure appreciate that. We hope you have a great morning with us. And in the back of the pockets, kind of on the pews, there are some connection cards. If you're new here, if you wouldn't mind filling that out so that we know that you're here, but also it's a way that you can communicate with us if there's anything that we can do to come alongside you in your spiritual journey. So please fill that out. Or if you're here and you have new contact information, that's a great place to include it. And then just hang on to that card and I'll tell you a little bit later in the service what to do with that. But this morning, Pastor Bob is going to be speaking to us about bringing out the best in other people. And I think for some people that comes really naturally. Some of us, it's pretty hard, like me. So I'm really looking forward to what he's going to have to share. Um, yeah, so thank you, Pastor Bob, for doing that. And as he comes up, would you mind just standing up and greeting some of the people around you? Lots of friendly faces in the room. Just a chance to say good morning. This morning, hi, my name's Bob. Glad you're with us. If this is your first time, like Celeste said, we're just thrilled that you're here. We trust that you'll experience the presence of God today. I'm just excited to, to really speak to you today. I couldn't, get, I couldn't stay in bed past five, about 10 after, 15 minutes after five. I was excited about getting ready and being able to share with you. I want to just say a couple things. You might see something that looks like a history wall out in the foyer. All of you that were here yesterday, thank you for being here. We have a great start about what we're doing in transition. And uh, so I want to just encourage you. Thank you for being there. Our transition team met afterwards for about an hour. We're going to be praying about some things, about what our next steps are. So we'll communicate that with you as soon as we are able. And uh, we're just glad that we are able to be a part of that. And uh, I'm excited about that. Continue to be with your group and your triads as you pray through the material. Looking forward to getting that back from you when we're done our 10 weeks. And if you haven't been in a triad, you'd like to be a part of a triad, that means you and two friends, or you and two new friends. Um, then we would like you to be a part of that as well as we carry on in our transition time. This morning I want to share with you a message about bringing out the best in others. And at the very outset, I want to say this. I am not an expert at doing this. I'm a learner just like you. There are times where I hit it out of the park, and there are times when I strike out. You know what an expert is, right? X is an unknown quantity and spurts a drip under pressure. 
I'm not, a, I'm not under pressure other than the Spirit of God wanting me to do something and sharing with you this morning. And it just so happens, I know we're part of a big alliance family. We heard about that yesterday morning as we looked at our, our denomination and our history of our, of our church. A church that I served in in Ontario, it's called Quinty Alliance Church, today is having their 100th anniversary service. And they wanted me to be there, and I said, well, I really would love to. I'd love to go and party with you, but I have some obligations. And, uh, and, and that's awesome, because that's what I signed up for. And uh, so one of my friends decided to go through the photo albums and start sending me pictures. I want to show you someone who built me up like nobody else. Show the picture for me if you can. Here we go. Be kind. I'm the guy on the right, the skinny guy. That was 100 years ago. No, it wasn't 100 years ago. But the guy on the far would be, I'm on this side, I think, and he's on this side. Elmer was on this side. Elmer was my senior pastor at the time. I was a youth pastor. Elmer was one of my mentors. He worked with me from afar. I was in another church prior to coming on staff with him. He was a gentleman that absolutely had very strange, not strange, straight conversations with me about my role, about my walk with God, about his expectations for me. He was someone who actually fanned me into a flame, taught me how to pray. I could literally, in the little church that we were in, the vents were connected between his office and my office, and I could hear him pray through the vent. And he would pray every morning for about an hour, and I was so I was so taken by that and so encouraged and, and challenged by that. But he went to be the Lord and up with the Lord a number of years later due to cancer. But um, I just want to let you know that there's part of the journey where I was learning right at the very beginning about how to build up others because others built up me. Let me ask you some questions this morning. Do, do a, a, a personal inventory of all the lessons that you've taken. How many of you ever taken music lessons? <laughs> I should ask, how many of you stayed with music lessons? Well, I didn't stay with <laughs> How many of you taken swimming lessons? All right, how about driving lessons? Some of you need some more. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> how about golf lessons? I'm going to find that out this summer when I go golfing with some of you folks. We might be going for lessons together. How many of you ever taken dance lessons? All right, cooking lessons. How many wish they would take cooking lessons? <laughs> Horseback riding, tennis, public speaking lessons. How about scuba diving? Got some great lakes around here. You wonder if some of you are not scuba divers. While colleges and universities, universities offer incredible courses, there's one area of lessons that most of us had never any public or formal training in, and that's what we're talking about during this series on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the most important area, and it's the area of relationships. We all need lessons on relationships. We all need lessons on loving, and that's why we're doing this series to learn how to love. Our passage this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, that says, love is kind. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be kind? Kindness is love in action. The Phillips translation, I think it's in your notes, says, love looks for a way of being constructive. Circle being constructive in your outline. What does it mean to be in, in, in being instructive? Constructive, pardon me. It's love looks for ways of improving somebody else's life. It builds people up. Today we want to talk about how to be a people builder, and Romans chapter 15 verse 2 says, we should consider the good of our neighbor and build up his character. How do I build up people in my life? How do you build up people in your life? I think we have to look at Jesus. We have to look to Jesus and ask, what is it that he did to build up people? And our message is for today is for everyone that's here whether you're a teacher, a parent, a husband, a wife, a friend, if you work with business partners, if you go to school, all of us have people around us that we'd like to build up and we'd like to bring out the best in them as well as they help bring out the best in us. So today we're going to look at four things 
that you can give people that will build the best in them. You build people up by kindness, not by criticism. Kindness is giving people what they need, not what they deserve. You might want to write that one down. Kindness is giving people what they need, not what they deserve. And Jesus gave people four things, and the four things that he gave, you and I need to learn to give in order to be going to be a people builder. We're going to have to bring out the best in people. We're going to have to model what Jesus did. So the first thing I want to look at here, are you ready for us this morning? Are you ready to go? Are you with us? Nod your head or something. Make sure you're sleep, not sleeping. Poke the person next to you and say, this is good. You should listen. Poke him back and say, you need this. All right, let's go. Number one, give them a personal challenge. This may be difficult when you and I live in a culture of people who get offended quickly. Oh, mercy. What a day and age we live in, right? Left to our own devices, we will take the path of least resistance. And Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Those are pretty powerful words, but let me give you the context of where, Peter, of where Paul is when he's writing this for us. He's in prison. He's not preaching in a church. He's not standing in a corner in front of business people and saying this is how you want to live. He is living in a cell and recording these words for us because he was giving his life for the calling that God had given him. He told the story of grace in the three chapters prior to this verse, and Paul is urging people to make their lives count. He's challenging them. He's saying, don't waste your life. Be all that God wants you to be. Make your life count. Well, you might ask the question, why? Because we all need a cause. We all need a project. We all need a dream that comes forth and calls forth the breath best in our lives. It strengthens us. For 12 years, the Green Bay Packers had only won 30% of their games, and by 1958, they were 1 and 10. Sounds like another football team, I know. I won't say the colors of it. And don't you think I'm thinking about what you're thinking, because I'm not. But they had a losing season for 12 years, a terrible team. And along came a guy named Vince Lombardi, and he was a people builder. And during the next nine-year reign with the Packers, he had nine winning seasons. They beat their opponents 75% of the time and walked away with five national championships and two Super Bowls. His team, he took from losing into a winning team, and he was a people builder builder. So how do we bring out the best in people? Well, by issuing personal challenges. That's how he did it. He challenged the players. We all know there's more to life than just living for ourselves. There must be a cause. There must be a reason. There must be a purpose for me to be here rather than to just take up space. And, and all of us need somebody in our lives who can inspire us to be what we can be, just like Elmer was for me as a young pastor. There are people in your life that God wants to use you to be a people builder, bring out the best in others, and inspire people to be what he knows they could be. And how do you know what God wants you to be? We'll look at the next slide. By looking at our strengths and abilities, God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other, passing on to others God's many kinds of blessings. Remember last week we talked about our shape, the way that God has designed us. That's to help us make a difference in this world. He says to look at your strengths. And the way that you know that God wants what you want, pardon me, the way you know what God wants to do in your life is to look at how he has gifted you, how he's talented you, and how he's given you competencies. See, people are shelling out big money to get people to tell them 
they're good at stuff. Why? Because we all need someone to give us a personal challenge. Somebody who will help us to discover what we're good at and bring out the best of us. Somebody who can find a challenge that will help develop us and strengthen us. The Bible teaches that that's what the church is to do. It's one of our goals at Circle. We're here to help build people, to help people discover and develop what God wants them to be. There's a whole process here at our church. It's the growing path that we have. It starts with you connecting here. Then as you sense drawing God drawing you into his family, then the ne- next steps are following the Lord in baptism and, and choosing to join us by attending a membership class, which, by the way, is happening right after our service. They build on each other. And then you fill out an analysis of your five different things, the shape that I talked to you about last weekend, and the number one job here in the church is to help you to become all that God wants you to be. You need people builders. And rather than criticizing the worst in others, they bring out the best. They challenge the best in others. And so this morning you see on your outline, there's a little bit of a quiz. Well, not a quiz. It's a little bit of a scale. You see the scale there, 1 to 10? All right, take a minute and rate yourself here. I want you to evaluate yourself on these four qualities. So from 1 to 10, 1 being, ah, not so good, 10 being, I knock it out of the park. How much time do I spend thinking about challenging others, drawing the strength out of others? Write it down. Maybe you've never even thought about it. Well, circle a one. Now you can start thinking about it. Peter Drucker said, we need to build on people's strengths and make their weaknesses irrelevant. All of us have weaknesses, but we need to build on our strengths. And if you're going to be a people builder to bring out the best in the people around you, then you've got to give them a personal challenge. And secondly, you've got to give them complete confidence. I recall as a teenager, our youth group leader pulled me aside one day and said, Bob, you have leadership traits. I didn't even know what those things were. She said, I believe in you, and I believe that you can lead us. And she asked me to step up in the youth group. Paul said in Romans chapter 15, verse 2, we who are strong in the faith ought to help the weak in order to build them up in their faith. We all need confidence, friends. When somebody believes in you, it brings out the best in you. It gives you courage. When they say, I know you can do that, it's almost like we have to borrow their their, their belief in us so that we can move forward and take a chance. Jesus said this to Peter. Peter's name was Petrus, which means pebble. And Jesus said, pebble, you're going to become a rock. I'm going to give you a new name. And his name was Peter Simon Barjona, which means son of John. But when Jesus said to Peter, he said, Peter, you're anything but a rock. He was Mr. Impulsive, put his foot in his mouth, you know, hey, let's do it, think about it later, walking on water and slipping. But Jesus said, you're going to be a rock. Jesus didn't tell him what he was, he told him what he could be. Build them up. One time, God said to a man in the Old Testament, and I recall reading about this as we're going through our Bible reading program last month about Gideon, and Gideon (laughs) is hiding from the enemy in a well-thrashing grain. He's, 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 he's hiding because he's going to fear that he's going to lose the very grain that he is thrashing because of the enemy. <laughs> and God says to him, while he's in that place, hiding, Gideon, you are a mighty man of courage. Now, isn't that funny? He's anything but courageous. Gideon was the biggest wimp out there, yet God says, this is what I see in you. You can become a man of courage. That's what it means to build up people by giving them confidence. Encourage them. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Encourage one another and build each other up. This is talking about the power of affirmation. This is talking about if you want to be a people builder, you've got to be good at encouragement. 
And as Celeste said, some of us are good at it, and some of us have to work at it. For some of your personalities, man, you just give out encouragement all the time. It is so natural for you. For the rest of us, it is a hard thing that we have to learn, but it's still a necessary skill that we need to learn. Ken Blanchard, who wrote The One Minute Manager, said, catch people doing something right and then tell them. The world we live in, we catch people doing something wrong and then we tell them. We all need encouragement. On those days when I'm discouraged, when I'm down, when I'm tired, I allow others to build me up. If I just don't have the strength because of the work that I'm doing and the burden that I'm carrying, then it's encouraging to me that that at some time in my life, any time that I need encouragement, I can call my wife or I can text my sister because they know I have value. We all need encouragement. Do you need encouragement this morning? Here's, a, here's, here's one of the ways that you know if people need encouragement, if they're breathing. Who have you walked beside to encourage and speak into their life just because you see their potential when they don't see it in themselves? If you want to be a people builder, you've got to give people a challenge, and then you've got to say, I know you can do it. And whether you're working with your kids or your husband or your wife or your employees, I know you can do it. Let me give you a couple of suggestions about giving encouragement. When you encourage people, it needs to be real from the heart and not just phony manipulation. It needs to be sincere. It needs to be genuine. It needs to be real. Secondly, it needs to be regular. Don't be stinsy with your encouragement. Give it out all the time. And remember, for some of us who are task-oriented people, it's very difficult for us to even think about that. But we need to do it. Everybody. We need to encourage everybody. The waitress, the Uber driver, all around us. Thirdly, it needs to be recognizable. For it to be effective, it needs to be precise. The more specific you are encouraging people, the greater impact it has on them and the more power it packs when you give it to them. Have you ever had a compliment that you didn't know whether it was a compliment or not? Anybody? I appreciate the things that many people say to me after a message, but sometimes I don't know where they're coming from. And I wrote a couple of these down. One little guy said to me, Pastor, you're really full of it. (laughs) What did he mean? Lady said to me, when you speak, you're never going to get better. Okay. Thanks for that encouragement. Oh, it gets better. A guy said, I think you're a model pastor. So I went home and looked up the word model, and here's what it says. A cheap plastic imitation of the real thing. (laughs) One more. Guy said to me, your sermons are like water to a drowning man. (laughs) Some of you will get that tomorrow, I think. Another guy who started falling asleep during the service afterwards said, I'm sure you noticed that my eyes were closed, but I didn't miss a thing. Nobody here has ever said that to me. Now rate yourself on how you encourage others. Give yourself a one to ten, ten being the best. But just take a minute and just circle that. And just At the end, I just want you to say, okay, God, how can I move these over a couple notches? What do I need to do? Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, I am sure of this, that God who began a good work in you will carry it on until it is finished. Dad, when was the last time you actually wrote a specific note of encouragement to your children about the strengths that you see, about their creativity or their faithfulness or their honesty or their persistence? I'm not talking about a text. I'm talking about a note. 
I mean, this, this message as I was preparing it convinced, convicted me about writing more notes to my family. When was the last time, husbands or wives, you wrote a love note to your spouse? When was the last time you wrote a note of encouragement to your teacher who was doing a good job? Teachers always hear about how they're doing a bad job with our kids, but do they ever hear you're doing a great job? When was the last time you wrote a note of encouragement to a friend who had a major impact on your life? And I encourage you to write it down. Be specific. A note says you took the time to care. I hear people say, whenever there's something wrong, I hear from my boss. That's poor leadership. If the only time you hear from your boss is when you do something wrong, that's not good leadership. Number three, you ready for a couple more? I got a couple more minutes. You ready? Number four, or number three, just making sure you're listening. Give them honest counsel. There is no process and progress without learning. There is no learning without feedback. And we need honest feedback. Since none of us are perfect, you see, some of our perception gets off base, and we need people to go, come on, just come on back here. You've just veered off a little bit. You, you can do better. We all need people who will lay it on the line and be honest with us with occasional correction. Proverbs 27, verse 17, in the Good News translation, says people learn from one another just as iron sharpens iron. We bring the best out in each other. When we do that, Sometimes we cause a spark, like iron on iron. Here's a question for you this morning. How teachable are you? Seriously. How teachable are you? You see, there are two extremes that don't help us. One, when I know it all, I can't help you if you know it all. And the other extreme is, I don't fall off my chair. The other extreme is, is that you can't learn anything. Those things aren't helpful. What's helpful is, I know I'm human, I know I need to learn, I know I need to grow, and I know I need your feedback. You see, an honest answer is the sign of a true friendship. A real friend will tell you when you're making a mistake. A real friend will level with you and when you do something like that with a friend, you risk everything. But if you care enough to correct and confront and you lay it on the line, even though it may be painful, painful when you're telling the truth in the right spirit, friend, I think you're off base here. You're wasting your life. You see, people who do this just don't let people waste their life in silence. Proverbs 27 Verse 6 in the Good News says, A friend means well even when it hurts you. He's doing it for your benefit. She's doing it for your benefit. And sometimes I find that even as, Christi as Christians, we don't do this really well. We take offense where we ought to be rejoicing that someone cares enough to say, you know what, you need to just pull in a little bit. Correction is very powerful, and it can be dangerous stuff. Correction done the right way will build people up. However, a correction done the wrong way can scar a person. So when you correct somebody, it is very serious, and you have to do it the right way. And what's the difference between the right way and the wrong way to correct? It's your attitude about correcting. If your attitude is, I'm going to point this out, weakness out in your life, just for the sake of pointing out because it's wrong, then that's wrong. Don't do it. People don't need to have their faults pointed out. We all are aware of our faults for the most part. If all you're going to do is point out somebody else's fault, don't do it. The purpose must be not to condemn, but to correct. To help them make a change in their behavior, you need to ask yourself, what is my motive here? Am I correcting them for my benefit? or for their benefit. Many times I, I, we want to correct people just because they're being jerks and they're harassing us. 
We think, you know, I just want them to stop being a jerk. My life would be easier. That's the wrong motive. You don't correct people for your benefit. You correct them as an honest friend for their benefit. So do you have the right motive? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4, verse 15 says, Speak the truth in love. That's the attitude. Love means giving the person what they need, not what they deserve. The motive has to be not to condemn, but to correct. You speak the truth in love. And friends, I don't do this all the time really well. I'm preaching to me. That doesn't mean we don't need to try to do it by God's Spirit. So how do we do it? The key to proper correction is you affirm the person and correct the behavior. Whether it's a friend, a child, a husband, a wife, or a boss, affirm the person and correct the behavior. John Wooden, one of the greatest basketball coaches that ever lived, year after year of consecutive NCAA championships for the UCL of Bur- Bruins, was an incredibly successful man. And one of his final se- seasons, a couple of research psychologists went to study his coaching techniques. What was his secret? His technique was what he called scold instruct. Now just stay with me. He would say to the person, don't do it this way, do it that way. And then he would demonstrate to the basketball player how to do it. He'd show them how he wanted it done. The purpose was never to say, you're blowing it, you're doing it the wrong way. The purpose was always not like this, like this. He always demonstrated what he wanted. And so the focus was on improvement, not on punishment. You focus on affirming the person and correcting the behavior and speak the truth in love. So now take the, take the little survey on a scale of 1 to 10. How well do you do there? Am I good at correcting without condemning? Or do I need a little bit of improvement? Number four, let's wrap this up. Give them full credit. Give them full credit. If you want to be a people builder, bring out the best in the people in your life and give them full credit. Praise the growth and the changes you will see in their lives. Look what it says there in this passage in Romans. Let us have real warm affection for one another and a willingness to let others have the credit. I've studied a lot of leaders. And one of the things that impressed me about Norman Schwarzkopf in the Desert Storm operations was that he was constantly giving credit away. He was always pointing to the guys in the trenches who were under his command and to the president, Colin Powell, and whoever. Schwarzkopf was a genius. He had 170 IQ. He was a mastermind, but he always gave credit away. How do you do that? How quickly are you to share the credit? Usually we like to share the blame, but not the credit. And God makes the mark, says that the mark of maturity is to accept the blame and to share the credit. The exact opposite. When you look at these four things on how to be a people builder, give them a personal challenge, give them complete confidence, give them honest counsel and full credit. That's a lot of work. And yes, and you're not always going to like feeling like you need to do it or feel like doing it. Kindness always costs. And there's a price tag for being a people piecer, people builder. It requires time, effort, money, energy, a lack of privacy. It always costs to be kind, and most of it costs, they're related to unselfishness. You see, it takes unselfishness to be a people builder. And usually we're so caught up in our own thing that we don't have time to build anybody else up. We focus on me, myself, and I. And and we don't care about anybody else. I mean, we don't say it out loud, but we're focusing on me. And what happens is if I want to be a people builder, I have to be unselfish. It costs to be kind. So why should we do it then? We'll look at the next passage in your notes. 
in response to all God has done for us. Let us outdo each other in being helpful and kind to each other. Remember, as I started at the beginning of this month, we talked about this message. What has God done for you? God's been kind to you. We owe it to others to be kind to them. The Romans back then, when the first Christians were formed after Jesus came on earth, used to confuse the word Christos with Christos. Christos meant Christ. Christos in Latin meant kindness. Now I know why they got them confused. Because that's who Jesus was. If anything ought to be synonymous, it ought to be kindness in a Christian. Christians ought to be the kindest people in the workplace. And what does it mean to be kind? To give honest, personal challenges, to, to raise their confidence, to give them counsel, and to give them credit. That's what it means to be kind to people. To look ways of being constructive and building them up. So how do you rate as a people builder? How many people do you know who would say that you do this to them? I give you a challenge. I want to challenge you. I want to, I want to give you a new object for life. A new objective, new purpose. Whether you live another five, ten, hundred years, I want to challenge you to make as your primary objective in life that I will commit myself for the rest of my life to be a people builder. Say, today I'm going to commit my life, no matter how long it is, to bring out the best in people that I can come in contact with. I'm going to dedicate my life to actively looking for constructive ways to build people up. Imagine the impact of our church family. If we would all commit our lives to being people that built other people up. Everybody we meet. We're going to try to bring out the best in them. We're going to try to develop what God has made in them. The first thing we need to do is share the good news. Share the good news with them and then help them grow and recognize their strengths. That's the purpose of our church. If you do that, Proverbs 11, verse 17 in the Good News Bible says, you do yourself a favor when you're kind. The international version says the kind man benefits himself. When we help other people succeed, we succeed. When you help other people, when you win, any executive of a successful corporation will tell you that that's true. You make other people successful and the whole company successful. What you sow is you reap. What you reap. And I challenge you today to say, I'm going to become as a, 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 my life objective a people builder no matter what else I get done. I want to be a people builder. That's what I want to do. That's my role as a transition pastor. To do these four things. I'm committed to bringing the best out into you, in you and the best out in this church and help you discover and develop what God made you to be. He made you to be kind people, happy people, fulfilled people. You see, unkind people are miserable. I know a few of them. People who think only of themselves, no matter how much money they've got, are miserable. And the person who gives their life away is the one who enjoys it. Amen? Will you pray with me? Dale, won't you come? Will you commit to bringing the best out in people that God has placed in your life? and the lives that he will place in your life in the days and years ahead? Would you say in your heart, God, I do want to become a people builder? Who do you know? 
people you could use this building up? Who do you need to sit down and think about this week, about their strengths, and then challenge them with the strengths that you see in their lives? And God has placed people around you that he wants you to build up. Who do you need to write a note to, a note of encouragement? Who do you need to correct lovingly? And to whom do you need to give more credit? See, the kindest thing that you can do for somebody is introduce them to Jesus. Who could you invite to church? That starts them on the road to becoming all that they're meant to be. And, and some of you need to begin your own spiritual growth process. Some of you need to take the first step, be a part of our family. You need to go maybe even today to our membership class. You're more than welcome. We want you to become what God has shaped you to be. And some of you need to say, Jesus Christ, come into my heart and help me to become what you made me to be. And if you've never done that, you can do it now. Make that your starting decision. Christ, come into my life and help me discover what you made me for. I want to know you, and I want to follow you. And I want to be found in this family to grow in you. Will you lead us? Father, I thank you for this challenge today. It challenges me personally. I know it challenges all of us. May we continue to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who gave his life for us. May we show that kindness too. For I pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Well, thank you so much, Bob. Really appreciated your message. And you reminded me of something my mom has always said to me. Um, if you're ever feeling crummy about yourself to try to do something nice for someone else. And I appreciate that what you shared was so others focused. And I think when we do things for others, we don't do it so that we'll receive a blessing, but often in God's economy, that's what happens, right? We do something for someone else, but we ourselves are blessed. So thank you for that message. And uh, if you're here, you know, when, when Pastor Rob's sharing Bible passages, we put them up on the screen. But if you would like to follow along in a Bible on your own and you don't have one, we would love to put a Bible in your hands. And so after the service, you can go to our information desk and grab one there. Or even if you'd like a Bible just for at home for your own personal use. Um, the Bible is a powerful book. I try to read it every day. And even just this week, God was showing me new things in his word. And um, so in Isaiah 2.22, there's this little verse that says, Stop trusting in man who has but a breath in his nostrils of what account is he and uh, he used that verse to teach me something, to remind me of something. And it's not to say that people aren't important, not at all, but just that all that we have is, is one breath in our nostrils. And so why do I trust in people? And even more so, why do I trust in myself? Because I'm weak and I'm imperfect. And so for me, when I was kind of burying some weight, I think that was too heavy, as an opportunity to say, like, Celeste, stop trusting in yourself. Trust in me. And I was able to give some of that weight to him. And, and that was really meaningful for me. And I think God can do that in all of our lives as we read his word. He can teach us some meaningful, personal lessons. So if you need a Bible, please grab one after the service. And I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward now. They're going to help us with our giving. We're gonna, they're going to be passing around an offering plate. So if you filled out a connection card earlier, you can put that in the offering plate. But also, too, if you have any financial gifts, 
that you'd like to give for the work, the ministry that happens here. There are also some other ways to give. Uh, we have a QR code you can use. You can give at our information desk as well. If you're a guest here, no obligation at all for you to give and no expectation even for you to give. We're glad you're here. But those of us who call Circle Home do like to contribute to all the great things that happen here. And one of the way that we do that is through our financial gifts. So I'm just going to pray for that. God, thank you for all that you have provided for us. And thank you that we can share with others in meaningful ways, in ways that people's lives are changed. So we ask you to please help us to be wise and generous in our giving. And God, would you please multiply these gifts Please use these gifts to help people know that you love them, to help people in their journey with you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. One of the things that those gifts helps towards is our ministry here at the church, our Kids Caper Summer Camps. And I'm thrilled to be able to say that our grade school camps are all full. So that's great news. Yeah, and we have a preschool camp. There's still a few spots left there. Um, but one of the things I love about kids' capers is that kids go as participants, they love it, and then when they grow up, they start volunteering because for them, they just see the significance of those camps. It's fun for them, it's meaningful for them, they get to learn about God, learn that Jesus loves them. I read in an email I got from Bob recently that for those camps, each camp requires 40 volunteers in this church on the ground and we do four of them. And on top of that, there are a lot of support roles that need to be filled as well. So this is just a huge endeavor. Now, how many of you in this room have never personally been a camper at camp? Maybe just put up your hands. Okay, there should be more hands than that. <laughs> if you've never been a camper at Kids Capers Camp, you haven't had firsthand experience of what that is like. And so uh, I think that as adults in the room, if we can follow the lead of those campers who have become volunteers and just to understand the significance of those camps, the potential there for kids, they have fun, but it's also meaningful because they hear that Jesus loves them. Sometimes they don't hear that message at home, and sometimes they even bring that message home. And we've had people start coming to our church because of their kids in kids' capers. And that's significant. It's just such a significant opportunity for us. And we carry that responsibility as a church, all of us. It takes the whole church, all of us, to be involved in doing that. And so when you came in, you may have received a handout. It talks about Kids Capers and some of the roles that are available. If not, you can grab one of those on the way out. We also have a QR code as well for the roles that are available. Um, but I'd like to be so bold as to say I think that everyone here would be capable and able to fill one of those roles in some way. And I'm going to ex explain why. So all of those roles require at least a little bit of time. But if you know how to operate a pair of scissors, <laughs> you could help with our Kids Capers Camp because one of, the, one of the roles to fill is to helping with craft prep. Some of those roles do require some skill, like maybe baking or helping out with AV. If you have any of those skills, we sure would appreciate your contribution. But a lot of those roles, too, they just require heart. I was even thinking about our leaders, the leaders that we need for those camps. And if you're a caring person, uh, that is a way that you could contribute. Because kids, what do they want most of all? I think they want to feel safe, but they all want to be, also want to be seen. They want to be loved. And so if, if you are a caring, kind person, that's a role that you could perhaps fill. Because we have a team with the skills to plan everything, make it fun, plan all the crafts, plan all of the learning. We need some leaders, though, to work with those kids. And this is a ministry that we've had at Circle Drive here for over 40 years. This year is our 41st year of Kids Capers, which is amazing. And I would just love to see our church be able to continue that legacy. I actually hate to think that maybe not enough of us would contribute to that and we wouldn't be able to have our Kids Capers camps. I also hate to think that maybe not enough of us would sign up and then we would have people carrying more weight than they are able. And so just I would love to be able to say something that would convince all of us <laughs> to just sign up and contribute. Um, but please uh, just 
I'm going to be in the snack room. I'm going to be the snack lady for the preschool camp. If you want to join me, come join me. But if we could please all just find some way so that we would carry that responsibility together it, and it wouldn't just rest on the shoulders, too, of our young people who are doing such an amazing job volunteering. Also, I want to just let you know, remind you, we have our weekend getaway couples conference next weekend. We've had 11 couples from this church sign up to go to that. So I'm so excited. That's what we'll be doing next Sunday. It's not too late to sign up, so if you're interested, please talk to me, Brent, or at the info desk, you can get some information. If you've been married two years or under, we can actually offer some uh, special scholarship for you for that. And please be praying that all of our couples there will be drawing closer to each other, drawing closer to God at that weekend. May 5th, we have a potluck for our Circle Drive family here from 5 to 7. We need to register for that. But uh, our, our church here, we're meant to take care of each other, but it's easier to do that when we know each other. And knowing and connecting takes some intentionality. So I'd just like to invite all of you to participate in that as well. And our prayer team's going to be coming up to the front here. If you would like prayer for anything, please join them. Or if you would like to know more how to take steps closer to Jesus, our prayer team would love to help you with that as well. So please join them. If you are interested in the membership class after church, it's okay if you haven't registered. That's in room 35. Please join us for that. One of the things I'll be talking about is baptism, what baptism means, um, why we get baptized. So if you're interested in baptism, you could go to that class. You could also talk to Pastor John anytime. But again, I just want to say thank you all so much for being here this morning. God bless you. And let's stand up and sing one more song together.
Have a great Sunday! 